not the watchdog. Good morning, Oasis of Hope. Good morning. It's good to see everybody that's here today. Good to be on Facebook and on YouTube. So we got people coming and gathering and getting in place and uh, we're going to start with a hymn this morning. Trust page 447 in the hymnal. If you need a hymnal, uh, let us know. We got a few, there's some in the church there if you need a hymnal. 447. recently. <laughs> really overcast day and kind of cool and in the 60s my weather bug said so um, we'll be 72 by the time we end our service today so it'll warm up. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to read from Psalm 18 uh, this morning and uh, Ponzi did a great job leading us off in the first part of this. We're going to finish it off today starting in verse uh, 24, 25, 25, I think. Um, and as Ponce reminded us of, this is a really special 
a psalm in that it was written by David um, on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hands of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Mm -hmm. So you can, ex you can feel the experience of David here as he realizes that God has just rescued him, right? And have you guys been rescued before by God? You know that feeling, right? And so when we get to um, Ponzi, we talk a lot about what God did. Now we're going to talk about just just uh, praising God, just praising God. So we're going to start in verse 25. It looks like I got everybody standing ready to go here. Hopefully at home you're doing the same. Let me read. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. <clears throat> with the purified, you show yourself pure. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem fortress. For you save a humble people, but the haughty eyes you bring down. Oh boy, my thing just switched. Sorry about that. Verse 28, for it is you who light my lamp, the Lord my God lightens my darkness, for by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for those who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my ways blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supported me. And your gentleness made me great. You gave a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me and those who hated me I destroyed. They cried for help but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as dust before the wind. I cast them out like the mire of the streets. You delivered me from strife with the people. You made me the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. As soon as, I, as, soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners came cringing to me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives. And blessed be my rock, the exalted be the God of my salvation, the God who gave me vengeance and subdued peoples under me, who rescued me from my enemies. Yes, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from the man of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations, and sing to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king, and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. Awesome. You feel David's excitement there, right? Being rescued by the Lord. And he gives God all the praise. And we can do the same. Let me pray for us this morning, and then we too will sing to the name of the Lord, right? And continue to worship. Let me pray. Father God, we just thank you this morning to be able to gather. Thank you for the cool autumn weather that's come upon us and all that summer heat that's behind us now. Father, we just uh, pray that, uh, that uh, you would help uh, through this cooler weather and maybe some rains coming soon to subdue all the fires that are going on around us and uh, get, those, get those taken care of. Father, thank you for purifying the air and making the air quality much better. For the first time yesterday, I got a, a clean air advisory instead of a 
bad air advisory. So we thank you for that, Father. Lord, we uh, continue to pray for this country and all the things going on in this country. Continue, Father, uh, to work out all the, the civil unrest and the things going on in that realm. God, we pray for these future elections, how important they're going to be for this country to move on. We pray you put the people in those positions that you have uh, decided to put in those positions, Lord. We pray your will be done in that area, Father. Lord, we continue to pray over this pandemic, and we continue to pray, Lord, that the numbers continue to get better and you continue to wipe this out. And we know it's your healing hand that's sweeping across this nation, across the world to do that, Father, and we thank you for that. We give you all the praise for that. Lord, now, as always, we dedicate this time to you. It's our time to stop each week, to set everything aside for just a moment, Lord, to put everything off to the side so that we can just think about you, we can praise you, we can honor you, we can bless you, Father. That's what we want to do now, this morning, in this service, through the reading of your word, which we've already done, through the worship that we're going to do, and through the message that Jesse has to bring this morning. Father, we want to bless you, we want to praise you, we want to honor you, we want to give you back our love, and thank you so much for your love in our lives. You are an awesome God. I can't say that enough. You are an awesome God. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I like what you read, Rick. There's something about the rest of that chapter also that uh, brings me to the reality of how awesome God is and how he can straighten things out and uh, take care of, vanquish our enemies and the things that are obstacles in our lives, in our nation, wherever it is. Okay, being all alone today makes it a little bit different. I never appreciated everybody more. In fact, it was really nice just to have Jess come up here and sing that next to me. Yeah, if you want to come on up, Jesse, that would really help. Uh, I think we're just going to go ahead and do this hymn. Page 280 in your hymnal. What was it? 280. 
Steve up here, if you guys remember, but actually it was before that, because we were praying, Lord, bring someone who can play and sing, <laughs> and help me, <laughs> but one day I said, hey, you guys were here, I said, hey, who knows this song, so you guys raised your hand, and then I said, hey, who's going to help me come sing this song, <laughs> and that's when Steve, the Lord had been putting it on Steve's heart to come and, and be our worship leader, so that was a... Uh, Glorious moment for me. So one good turn deserves another. Could, couldn't leave Steve. <laughs> Although he he does fine. I thought about that. When yeah. When I asked you to turn up. Yeah. It's time to turn. It's always more fun having someone sing with you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we got a couple visitors this morning. They've been here before, but just want to say welcome. Good to see you. And. Uh, you know, I'm glad to be back with you this Sunday. I was gone, you know, one Sunday. Uh, I had the privilege. I was asked to go preach at our church that we were before here. So it was just an awesome time of uh, being with family and preaching the Word of God. And I did watch, you know, I checked up on Rick. I watched the service. <laughs> you guys had an awesome service between the worship and song. Ponzi doing the call to worship, Rick throwing down the challenge of the scriptures of Jesus, of what it, what's the cost of discipleship, right? Mm -hmm. And are we going to take it serious? And you know, I'm thankful because this is a, this is a church that uh, we're going to take the cost of discipleship seriously. One reason I know that we do is because everybody's here on this brisk October day. But hey, we're not, you know, we're not uh, sweating and the smoke's not stinging our eyes, so. But hey, I just want to say, you know, I do miss being with you even one Sunday if I'm not here with you. I miss being here because I love you guys. God's called me to be part of this church, and uh, it's a privilege for me to do that. Uh, real quick, after service, I'm sure we'll make it brief, but we're, we're going to discuss 
uh, what we're going to do about our trunk or treat outreach. So that'll be just right after service. One, uh, another announcement, and it's coming up pretty quick here. Two weeks, Sunday, October 25th, which is a Sunday night at 5 p.m. <clears throat> down at uh, Waterford First Southern Baptist Church is going to be the CVBA annual meeting. It's going to be at 5 p.m. They will have dinner. They will be serving dinner. And it'll be outdoors. And if you want to sit in your car, you can sit in your car or, you know, they're going to do all the social distancing and all that. But um, if anybody wants to go and participate and, and um, you know, eat at the meal, we just need a head count by Monday, October 19th. We'll let Rod Earls know. And that way they know how much food to prepare. And so earlier this year, we usually have two you know, annual meetings, one in spring, right? The missions conference. And then we have the annual meeting in October. We weren't able to have the one in the spring because of COVID and the uncertainty but Waterford is going to go ahead and host um, the annual meeting. So I do encourage you, some of you went last year, and it'll be a great time. So if you want to go, and we'll announce it next week, we'll announce it the next, but um, calendar, and uh, Lord willing, I plan to go. It's good. You know, like last week I went and preached at one of our sister churches, right, down in Keys. They invited me to come down and great preached here. But we're in community with one another. And it's nice to know there's other churches, you know, that are doing the same thing. And we're here to serve one another too. Not just, we're, we're here to build the kingdom of God. Not just Oasis of Hope. Not just one church or whatever. We're here to build the kingdom of God. And that's one way we do it. One another. So I just want to give you that announcement. Also, we're going to celebrate um, the Lord's Supper today at the end of our service. So... Those of you online, here's your chance. You know, you can get up out of your chair and, you know, or off your couch or whatever. <laughs> and you can get some juice, bread, and you can participate with us, okay? So I encourage you to do that. So, and one last announcement. Steve was up here by himself. And a big reason of that, some of, uh, some of our young people uh, are not feeling well, you know, and, um, you know, how many things are there that could make us not feel well? Lots and lots and lots. It doesn't have to be COVID, right? How many times have we not felt well over the years because <laughs> of a myriad of things? But just out of caution, you know, some of those young people live at a Jesus mission since they're around each other. They just said, hey, we're going to stay home till, till we know. But I would like, uh, if I could ask Brother Doyle to come up and pray for those who are not feeling well. Some of our young people, and, you know, it's going around, so. And, you know, just pray for the Lord's wisdom, too, with, it just puts a new twist on it, having the COVID and saying, hey, I don't feel well, but what's the impact on my work or my normal social circles? So, Doyle. <clears throat> To say what is ever in our heart, Lord. And Father, when there are some that are missing from our local congregation, from the assembly of the believers, we ask, Father, that you would be with them, especially these younger ones, these ones that are the ones that provide the music for us. You know what their situation is. You know what they're going through with their health, Lord. So, Father, we just come to you and ask you to take care of them, Lord. To put a special anointing upon them. <clears throat> to protect them, Father, so this illness of whatever it is that they have, it could be just the flu or the cold, or it could be just like they're getting older like I am <laughs> and feeling the aches and pains that all of us feel, Lord. Because there's not a one of us here that don't need your healing touch, Lord. Amen. We all need you, Father, and we depend upon you. We depend upon you for our spiritual growth and for our health and for all of our needs. And Father, we just pray that this service would bring honor and glory to your name, Lord. In Jesus' name.
Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> I talked with some of them, and I know a few of them are kind of bummed out. They love being here. They love serving. They love being with God's people. So we just want you to know that if that's you this morning, we're praying for you. We love you. We appreciate you. We're looking forward to you being back with us, worshiping in person. So praise the Lord. Well, this morning, we're going to resume going through the book of Acts. So we will be in Acts chapter 24 and verses 22 through 27. I'll let you guys turn there as we get ready to go into the word. Let's go to the Lord one more time in, in prayer as we, as we turn to his word. Lord, thank you for this morning. Lord, impact us by the power of your word. Lord, it's you have the words of eternal life. You have all the direction we need for our lives. Speak to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, chapters 24, 25, and 26, they cover a period of just over two years of Paul's uh, ministry, but in this time of his ministry, he's being detained in Caesarea. After having testified of Jesus in Jerusalem and prior to being sent to Rome. So we know that uh, Paul felt led by the Spirit you know, to go up to Jerusalem. And he did that. And now, and, and uh, while he was there... The Lord told him, as you've testified of me in Jerusalem, so you also must testify me of me in Rome. But right now we're in this interlude in between, which is a long interlude. It's over two years. If I was going to title this section of Scripture, 24, 25, and 26, I would call it A Tale of Three Trials. And... Uh, Actually, that's what I did title my sermon, so <laughs> if you want to write that down, <coughs> a, tri <laughs> a tale of three trials, right? As Paul, he's tried, you know, in these chapters 24, 25, and 26, before the governors Felix and Festus, and then he'll be tried before King Agrippa. You know, as, as you read through these accounts something interesting starts to emerge. We know that Paul is on trial, right, between before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. But do you know who actually ends up going on trial? That we went, you know, you don't at first think about it, but really the ones who end up going on trial is each man, each person, each group, who finds himself having to judge Paul's case. It's not just Paul on trial here. That's what, what, what we're going to find out. You know, after listening to the facts, both, both the accusations by the Jews and then the defense that, defenses that Paul gives, how each one handles the situation, Felix, Festus, Agrippa, it becomes a test of their character and it becomes a revelation of their heart and also their spiritual condition. Proverbs 17, 3, very interesting uh, proverb. It says, the crucible for silver, the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests each one's heart. Fire tests the purity of silver and gold, and a person's heart is tested by the Lord. I want to ask you a question at this point in Paul's ministry. How much testing, how much refining has Paul gone through? How much refinement has the Apostle Paul had to endure up to this point? How many times has he been in the crucible? 
How many times has God put Paul directly in the furnace by the time we come to these three trials? And when we look at the Apostle Paul, whose image do we see? You know, uh, I was talking with Elise, and she was sharing with me that the silversmith or the goldsmith, when they refine, like say, take silver, they keep refining the silver, the dross, the impurities rise to the surface, and then they scoop them off and remove them, right? And then they refine it again, and they, they, they bring that purity, impurity to the surface and scrape it off and do it again. And they do it until the silversmith can look into the silver and see his own reflection. When he can see his own reflection in the silver, he knows that's pure silver. The same thing with gold. And so God, with each of us, he put us in the crucible, he puts us in the furnace, and he turns up the heat until when he looks, he can see his image reflected in us. Okay? So at this point in Paul's ministry, we've read about all the things that he's gone through up to this point and how much refinement so the real issue at hand in these three trials, we're not trying to decide whether Paul, you know, is innocent or guilty or not. That's not what's going on. They all knew, knew he had done nothing worthy of chains or imprisonment. When you read through, listen to the admissions of Claudius Lysias, of Governor Felix, of Festus, of Agrippa. They all came to the same conclusion and said it the same thing in different ways. This man has done nothing worthy of chains or death. But each man has to try and decide how he's going to handle the situation given the pressures the Jews are exerting upon him. And they were exerting tremendous pressure on these government leaders. I mean, we know that Rome has the power, they're in control, but they were having to rule over very difficult people, a very independent and strong people with a national identity that you couldn't, you couldn't squash. So these Jews were exerting tremendous pressures upon these guys. Despite the fact that there's no merit to their accusations, as well as these guys who had to try Paul, they had to deal with the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their own souls as Paul boldly testified of the risen Christ, of righteousness, and of judgment. So not only is Paul giving his defense uh, to the accusations that the Jews are making against him, but in the process, he's giving the gospel too. And so these guys who are having to judge over this case... They're having to listen and, you know, they're like, okay, there's no, I can see there's no merit. There's no validity to these accusations that are being brought. They're unfounded. They're baseless. But also, Paul, when he gets up to speak, he never misses a chance to boldly testify for the Lord Jesus. And now they start, that brings some trepidation to them. It makes them, you know, kind of uh, nervous as they're sitting there trying to figure out what to do. And if you think about it, it's the same place that Pilate had found himself in, isn't it? Felix and Festus and Agrippa find themselves sitting in the place where Pilate sat, knowing without a doubt that Jesus was an innocent man, as Pilate testified when he came out to the crowd, I find no fault in him at all. Right? That's what Pilate said. I don't find any. He examined him himself. I find no fault in this man. Yet, he was wanting to gratify the crowd, the mob, who was crying out, crucify, crucify him. What does Pilate do under that? in that moment? He's in the crucible. He's not trying Jesus. Jesus is trying him. He's in the crucible. And he's got these pressures going on. On the one hand, he knows Jesus is completely innocent. He knows because of envy the Jews delivered up Jesus to be crucified. And 
what does he do? He caves in, doesn't he? He releases Barabbas to them when he should have released Jesus. He releases the guilty instead of the innocent, and he condemns the innocent to die. He delivers Jesus to be scourged and to be crucified. James 3.1 tells us, Friends, not many of you should become teachers. As you know, we teachers will be judged with greater strictness than others. I can imagine thinking about this scene, Pilate speaking to the young, up-and-coming, aspiring government rulers that want to fill these positions. This is what he might have said to them. Not many of you should sit in Caesar's judgment seat. As you know, we judges will receive a stricter judgment. <laughs> As Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, do you remember he received a message from his wife, an urgent message? Have nothing to do with this righteous man. I've suffered many things in a dream because of him. <laughs> right? Imagine sitting in that, in that seat with all these pressures. Jesus was never on trial. Pilate's on trial. And so this morning, <clears throat> we're going to keep going through a tale of three trials. A couple weeks ago, we had looked at, we, we began, you know, we went through the early part of chapter 24 when... Uh, Paul stands before Felix. He's tried before him. And we hear the opening statement is made by a guy named Tertullus, who was a lawyer, a big gun hired by the Jews to represent them. It's Paul. <clears throat> and, then, and then Paul, after the governor nods to him, Paul is allowed to speak in his defense, right? And so that's how far we had gotten through um, last week. So <clears throat> if you guys, if you'll, you'll turn to uh, verse 22, let's read Felix's response now after he had heard from, from the Jews and Tertullus and then after he heard from Paul. Verse 22, but when Felix heard these things, Having more accurate what knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, When Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for him or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, Jewish, <clears throat> he sent for Paul and heard him concerning faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away from now, for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him. Therefore he sent for him more often and conversed with him. <clears throat> but after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. <clears throat> so in verse 22, what Felix does at this point is something called temporizing. He temporizes. And that word simply means it's to avoid making a decision or committing himself in order to gain time. This is what he does, what he says in verse 22. What he says avoids making a, de a decision, making, you know, committing to any de action He's trying to buy himself some time. We would simply call it, he's stalling. <laughs> you know, we, we don't say, hey, I'm, 
Come on, man, you're temporizing. Come on, Ponzi. <laughs> quit temporizing. I'd be like, hey, quit dragging your feet. Make a decision. You're stalling on me, man. I know you're trying to buy time. You don't know what to do. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's what he does. He says... When Lysias, the commander, comes down, I'll make a decision on your case. We're never given any indication that Lysias, the commander, was going to come down. That's not even part of the equation. When, when, do you remember when Lysias sent Paul to Caesarea, you know, with, with the Roman cohort and all the cavalry and the soldiers and the centurions he wrote a letter to explain what's going on hey this guy you know he was going to be killed by the jews i found out he was a roman i went in and i saved him couldn't figure out what they were talking about something about their law so i sent him you know to you and he signs off so he he explains all the material facts that felix would need to know so he could proceed from there and what does he sign off he says farewell <laughs> basically we know what he's doing he's saying hey my duty my duty's done uh, you take it from here and so when Felix says yeah uh, when uh, uh, Lysias the commander comes down um, I'll make a decision right he's he's temporizing he's stalling What should have Felix have done? What should he have said in verse 22? <clears throat> what he should have done is he should have immediately discharged Paul and cleared him of any wrongdoing. He should have said, hey, all the accusations coming against you, they're baseless. They're without merit. Uh, there's lack of witnesses. There's lack of evidence. This is He should have said this is a farce, right? And he should have discharged him, given him his freedom. As Paul, he, this is what Paul said earlier in verses 12 and 13. He's, when he was giving his defense to Felix, and they neither found in me, you know, they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, I wasn't inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. Paul's like, hey, if you got witnesses, bring them to the witness stand. If you got pictures, get out your cell phone, bring the video. You know, <laughs> there's no evidence, right? That's what I've done. Paul's like, they got nothing on me. You ain't got nothing on me, guys. I'm clean. But instead, <clears throat> Felix, he, he places Paul into an indefinite period of detainment. He just bought him an unlimited amount of time. Lysias was never going to come. So he has as much time to figure out what he wants to do. You know, when Lysias comes, when is that going to happen? Probably never. In verse 23, <clears throat> it's basically when he gives the orders for keeping Paul. It's an admission of his wrongdoing in keeping Paul rather than releasing him. He tries to, Felix is trying to ease his conscience um, and give light restrictions on Paul. This is an admission, I should have let him go, but in, in, in his conscience... He knows he's done wrong. He's been weak. So he tells the centurion, hey, let him have some freedom. Don't forbid any of his friends to come provide for him or visit him. Don't keep him locked up tight, you know. After some days, not too long goes by, it says that Felix came with his wife, Drusilla. And if you want to read about some of their messed up, you know, uh, family dynamics. You can do the study on that, on their marriage, their relationship, and so forth. They're not nice people. Let me just basically boil it down to that. 
he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And basically, this is just like a, you know, um, an entertainment, you know, to pass the time, to hear something different. It's like a curiosity for his wife. I want to, oh, you have the famous Paul. I want to hear what he has to say. You know, this will be a novelty. This will be something, a distraction for an hour or two. Let's listen to Paul. And so he goes, okay. So he calls him. Let's, <clears throat> let's hear what he has to say. And this is where the prisoner turns the tables on the judge. Like we're talking about who's on trial here. Paul or Felix or Drusilla or who? Verse 25, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Hey, wait a minute. I just I kind of just wanted to hear about this sect uh, of the Nazar you know, of the Jews called the Nazarenes, and maybe hear something about this new religion. And now you've gone from preaching to meddling. You know? <laughs> now you're getting personal, you're talking about righteousness, you know, the judgment can uh, self-control and the judgment to come. So Paul, he doesn't waste an opportunity, does he? He goes, he's very direct. He's not like one of the Greek philosophers who's just kind of talking about his human intellectual wisdom. Oh, he's a great orator. This will be fun. Let's listen to Paul. Paul's like, hey, let me tell you a few things about the soon coming judgment about Christ returning with the clouds, you know, and with all the saints coming with him and so forth. It's like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> hey, I'm getting a little, it's getting a little, you know, intense in here, Paul. And it says that Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Here's the interesting thing. When the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes, when we communicate the truth of the gospel, the truth of judgment, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and it starts to turn the heat up on someone's heart, that cold heart of Felix for a moment, but if you put intense heat, if you put enough heat on metal, on a hard heart, it goes liquid, it goes molten, right? As long as you keep that heat. There's this moment where it goes from a solid state to a liquid. And Felix is hard in this moment when he's fearing, he becomes afraid. There's a moment there that he has an opportunity to respond and do the right thing. And when that heart is still liquid and molten, it can be poured into the proper shape that God would want his heart to be poured into. But... There's basically two molds, and that heart could be fashioned and formed the way God wanted it to. It could be poured that way, or it could go back into the old mold that it was in. And that's what he does. He becomes afraid. He has a moment where he could respond, but he withdraws. And when the, when the heat goes off and it solidifies again, Here's the scary thing. There may never come another moment when the heart is soft, when the heart's pliable, when the heart could be changed into what God would want it to be. And, you know, for the, for the unrepentant sinner, you know, that's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Don't harden your heart like you did in the rebellion. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't think... You know, there's something serious to this. I want to consider it, but I'm going to put it off. You don't know how long you have. Today is the day of salvation. This is the moment. If you use this opportunity correctly, you'll never need another moment like this. If you do the right thing in that moment, you don't have to have the heat turned up so hot on you like that again. But what's interesting, you compare... The same response happened, if you'll remember, to the Philippian jailer. He had the same response when the earthquake came, when Paul and Silas were in the jail praising God at midnight. 
and a great earthquake came and loosened all the doors, the chains, and the jailer fell in, you know, scared to death. He was trembling. It's the same exact thing. He was afraid, just like Felix, of what's going on. But what did he do differently? He said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He handled that moment the way God wanted him to, and he, if he had died that night, he would have went safely in the arms of Jesus, right? He would have never needed another opportunity. No one else would have had to preach the word of God to him. He responded. His heart was soft. He was afraid. He humbled himself, and in, and in great fear, he said, what, what must I do to be saved? And Felix, what a waste what a wasted opportunity he had right here. Not only that, but let me just speak to us who are believers. Let us not waste the opportunity when God turns up the heat on our own hearts and we know we must respond. Don't harden your heart and just say, yeah, I'll get to that. I should do that. Respond in the moment. We may not be given that moment again. That's our moment. Take Take advantage of it, man. God is doing something supernatural. He's making the heart pliable. He's making the will obedient to where we can say, yes, Lord. And that is our moment to respond. You know, that's what we're talking about. And Felix, he squanders the moment. He suppresses it, and we have no evidence that he ever um, acted upon it again. He was like, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'll come back at a more convenient time. When, we don't know, you know, when's the more convenient time, you know? Meanwhile, during this two-year imprisonment, verse 26, so he doesn't take the opportunity to repent and turn to the Lord like the Philippian jailer, but he hardens his heart. And he also hoped that he would get a bribe, receive a bribe from Paul. That's why he, he well, maybe if I keep bringing him back and talking to him often enough, he'll bribe me, and then I can let him go. Therefore, he sent for him the more often, conversed with him. But after two years <laughs> of that, time ran out. Festus succeeded Felix. <clears throat> and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Who was on trial? Felix. Felix caves in, you know, to the Jews. He'd rather try to curry favor with them, maybe secure his future, set himself up for retirement after being the governor, right? I'll not give a pardon so that I can, uh, you know, maybe get in good with these powerful Jewish leaders. And, man, hopefully before my time runs out, maybe Paul will get tired of being in this jail and uh, I'll get a bribe. And so he's greedy. Remember I told you that uh, uh, Tacitus had remarked about Felix, about his cruelty, and then he, that he ruled as a governor with the spirit of a slave, like cruel and tyrannical. He was, yeah, this was not a nice, not a good guy. So let me just conclude I want to just say, if we find ourselves on trial for being faithful to proclaim God's good news and live as witnesses, the ones who are really on trial are those judging us. If we find ourselves in the hot seat, really, the truth is, those who have placed us there who are trying to judge us and decide what to do. They're the ones, how they respond, they're in the hot seat 
as we go week, you know, we're going to see how Festus, how he uh, comes out. And then we'll see how Agrippa, how does he come out? But Paul, do you notice how, un and, and as we read all three accounts, I've been reading and reading all the accounts together, reading, reading. Paul never changes. He remains the same. He doesn't fluctuate. He's not fickle. He's not swayed by personal interest. He's not vacillating between trying to do the right thing or save his skin or whatever. Not like these other rulers that are in this place. And, and I would just uh, caution us when we are find ourselves um, having to make decisions or judgments about other believers in the body of Christ. How we handle them, it's a revelation of who we are, of where our heart is, and where we are, our spiritual condition. Let me tell you, how you handle your brothers and sisters, that's a revelation. Especially if you find yourself in a position where you have like some power, you have to make decisions, right? And it may be difficult. How you handle that moment is really more about you as a Christian than about them. To judge a member of the body of Christ is to judge Christ. That's why Jesus said, judge with righteous judgment. Remember Jesus in Matthew 25, he said, whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. And so how we treat we need to have sensitive hearts. We need to take it serious how before we think we're going to, you know, grab our fellow servant by the throat and demand that they pay, you know, I'll throw you into debtor's prison until you pay the last penny. When we forget all that great debt that we could never repay that God forgave us. Who just went directly into the judgment seat right who went on trial in that moment the guy who had the small infraction or the person who had no mercy in dealing with someone who made a small mistake so it's very it's a fascinating study all through the book the book of Acts when Peter and John were on trial before the Sanhedrin who was really on trial the Sanhedrin isn't it interesting? When you read the accounts, it doesn't say anything about Paul. It just says Paul said this, and then it'll say, you know, Felix was wanting to uh, gain favor. All the insights are not about Paul. They're about the ones who are in the judgment seat, those giving the judgments. And so it's a searching passage for us. One, it's an, it's an encouragement. If we've been refined and we're on trial we're in the hot seat because we've been faithful. We don't have to worry. Just give glory to God. Give the testimony. Tell the truth. Be a witness. And watch those who wrongly accused us squirm. Watch those who have to make a judgment be like, man, <laughs> I don't want to be in this place, right? Find out who's really in the hot seat. And number two, <clears throat> you know, if, if we find ourselves in a position where we've got to make some kind of judgment, you know, and, and sometimes we have to, but I'm just, I'm not saying it's wrong. Jesus never said it was wrong to remove the speck from your brother's eye. He just said, make sure you get the log out of your own eye before you try to do it, or else you're going to do a lot more damage trying to get that tiny speck while you, you're banging them with a big old log in your eye, you know, but it's okay to get the speck out. But how do you handle your brother and your sister? Are you gentle? Are you kind? You know? How do you come across? Let me just give you one final, what Paul, let me just tell you like a little insight of what he thought about being on trial. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he's talking about being an apostle, <clears throat> like him and, him and Apollos. He says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and as and stewards of the mysteries of God. So first of all, Paul said, me, on trial, I'm a servant, and I'm a steward of the mystery of Christ. That's why I'm on trial. And moreover, it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. 
But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. He goes, that, that's very insignificant that anyone that I be on trial or judged by man or a human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified this by this. He's saying, just because I don't know of anything right now doesn't mean I'm perfect. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. And then each one's praise will come from God. Paul said, I don't care. You can put me on trial. I have a clear conscience before God. I'm a steward of the mysteries of God. There's one thing that's required, steward, that you be found faithful. And he said, I don't care if I'm judged by you, by a human court. I don't even judge myself. I commit my judgment to the Lord who will judge me. Right? And that's what we do. We just commit. That's why Paul is so peaceful. He's not, he's not the one sweating it out, trying to buy time, stall. No, he just says the truth and just leaves it to the Lord. And so it's my, it's my encouragement for us this morning when it comes to, if we find ourselves in that place, either being judged or having to make judgments and decisions. And, uh, I'm going to close with that, and I'm going to ask Rick to come up now and lead us in our time of uh, observing the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> All right, this is an awesome time. I'm, I'm honored to, I appreciate Jesse asking me to lead. I'm always honored to lead a communion time. Um, I believe communion is one of the most important things that we do uh, corporately in worship and fellowship as a church. And um, this uh, is an important ceremony in the life of the church. It represents, you know, why Jesus came to earth in the first place, right? To sacrifice his body and give us his blood for our sins. For the Jews, it was the Passover ceremony, right? That was important to them. And that's kind of equal to our communion ceremony. The Passover looked back to the rescue God did for the Jews by delivering out, them out of the hands of the cruel Egyptians. They celebrated that year in and year out. For us, communion looks forward to the rescue that God has for us, right? From this cruel earth that we live in, right? And so it's it's a great time uh, to 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 celebrate uh, this service. Um, one of the things uh, that I know communion should be, and isn't always in all this communion services I've participated in, but it should be very intimate time. Um, if you think about what happened. Uh, in the first communion service, um, there was one person not present in that communion service, and that was Judas. He had already left. Why? Because he wasn't a true believer, right? And Jesus didn't want him to participate in that service. But for the other 11, what an intimate time they were going through, right? As Jesus knew what was about to happen to him. And even the... Uh, apostles recognized something's going on, right? They didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but you could feel the intensity in the room when Jesus does his first communion service. And it was just a very intimate time. That's what Jesus wants to have with you this morning. A very intimate time of communion together. Let's start with a reflection really important and a lot of a lot of services I've been to leave this out but this is so important because 1 Corinthians 11 
27 through 28 says, So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink the cup. And so that's what I want us to do this morning. I'm going to give you a moment to personally, again, intimately with your Lord, examine yourself. Right? Examine yourself. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's what part of this examining is right now, right? You want to confess your sins, you want to be pure, you want to be righteous before you receive this communion service, right? So I'm just going to stop for a minute and just let everybody kind of reflect uh, on their own and let the Lord speak to you. Confess anything that needs to be confessed. Repent of it. And then let the Lord forgive you and cleanse you of it and purify you. And then we'll be ready for the communion service. in a vision Paul had with Jesus, Jesus personally instructed him on communion. And I know that from what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I believe one of the most important instructions in all the communion passages you can read in Scripture is this one. Do this in remembrance of me. And it's kind of been boiled down in most communion services, as you know, to do this in remembrance of my death, burial, and resurrection. Right? But that's not what Jesus says. He says, do this in remembrance of me. And so I want us to think this morning more big picture. Think of all of what Jesus means to you, not just the death, the burial, or resurrection. Yeah, that's an important part of the service for sure. But think about Jesus being the creator of the world. We're told everything was created through him. Without him, nothing would be created. Think about the fact that Jesus calls you his friend. Think about the fact that Jesus calls you his brother. Think about all those prayers you've prayed to Jesus that he's answered over the years. Right? Think about the fact that he walks with you every single day through everything you're going through, good and bad. When Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, I think he was telling us to do it in remembrance of all of him. Right? So I want us to do that. I want us to think about those things. I want us to think about everything that Jesus means to us. So let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for all of who you are. Thank you for being our creator. Thank you for living the life you lived to model for us how we should live. Thank you for all the prayers you've answered in our lives. Thank you for being with us every day. How intimate is it, Lord, that you call us brother, that you call us friend? 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We want to do this service in remembrance of all of you. And of course, we do think of your your death and your crucifixion, your burial, and your resurrection. Those are obviously one of the more important of all the things we can remember about you. But we want to remember all of you this morning, Lord Jesus. So thank you for that. We praise you. We honor you. As we partake in these elements, Father, it's as a it's as an expression of our praise and worship to you. In your name, amen. Okay, Steve, you want to come and lead us? We're going to pass out the elements. Ponce, would you help me? And, um, and then I'll come back after Steve leads us in a song. we have this morning if you haven't figured it out you, the crackers in the top part there and the juice is underneath um, as we take the bread this morning let us remember um, what it represents it obviously represents the body of Christ Jesus said he was the bread of life, right? In uh, John 6, 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me 
will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Second, the bread represents Jesus' body that was given for us, right? We know his skin and his flesh were torn and broken by the blows with rods and fists and whippings and scourgings. He was kicked, he was spit on, he was mocked, he was rejected in every way. They put thorns on his head, they put nails in his hands and feet and a spear in his side. And he went through all those things for us. It wasn't Pontius Pilate who put him on the cross. It wasn't the Romans who put him on the cross. He gave himself to be put on the cross. And he did that for us. Isaiah 53, 5 says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The bread represents not only Jesus' mangled body, but it represents healing for our sins. Not only does the bread remind us of the body of Jesus, which is past, it's gone, but it reminds us of the present, that we are now the body of Christ, and we need to take the gospel forward. I'd like to have somebody come and pray over the bread. Carol, can I ask you to come and pray over the bread before we partake together? Would you be willing to come and pray for us? that we have before us represents his blood. To me, this is the capper on this whole communion service, right? Because his blood is what purifies us, right? His blood is what saves us. The Bible says that sin cannot be atoned for without the sacrifice of blood. In the Old Testament, the sacrifices that they did were just a symbol of the ultimate sacrifice, which was going to be Jesus Christ. Just a symbol. But they did that to atone for their sins at the time, right? Now the true blood has been spilt for us, right? The true blood of Jesus is what purifies us, is what makes God look down from heaven and see us as righteous people. None of us feel like we're righteous, right? Because we know all the sin that we perform in our lives, right? But God, because of the blood of Christ, sees us as righteous people. That is so awesome. That's what this juice represents. That's what it represents. 1 Corinthians 11.25 says, In the same he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. One more thing this juice represents that I think is so cool. Jesus made a promise about it in Mark 14, 25. He says, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. This represents our future hope in heaven. Because Jesus said it will be that day when we gather again to heaven that I will drink once again with all of you from this cup. Isn't that awesome? I think that's awesome. Fonzie, how about you come up and pray over the the juice that we're going to partake in. Holy Father, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So Father, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you so much, Lord, 
we're so grateful, Lord, that we can come before you, confess our sins, and you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, and that's because of your blood. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's partake together. What's our response at this point? The only response I know of is, is just to praise God, right? Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. Do all of you guys know the doc doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We're just going to do it a cappella, right? But it's a, it's a worthy way to praise God at the end of our communion service, okay? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. you right you know before as we close I just want to share you know the assumption is that most all of us are believers here this morning but if no one you know if you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ it's hard to have a uh, Lord's Supper service and do it in remembrance of him and not think of why he went to the cross he went to the cross to pay the price that we could never pay to provide forgiveness of sins through his death, his burial, and his resurrection, through his broken body and his shed blood. So if that's anybody, you know, whether it's someone present right here or whether it's someone listening online, you just reach out. You remember, as we talked about in the sermon, there's a moment when God makes our heart soft and makes it pliable by the word of God and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's your moment to reach out to God, to respond to him, to say, yes, Lord, I believe your assessment that um, I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws and I've fallen short of the glory of God, but you love me so much. You sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die in my place that if I would put my trust, I would repent, believe in him, I would be given everlasting life through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, you just say yes to the Lord. You say a prayer to him. He's looking at your heart. It's not a special formula or prayer. It's your heart bowing down, just like Steve uh, sung that song. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. And that's your duty, and that's your privilege. And Jesus made a way for you to do that. As someone who's broken God's laws, you could worship, bow down, and kneel before the Lord your God, your Maker. And you could receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in Christ and through, for, you know, through repentance. If that's you, you, you take that opportunity. And also today, be, you know, before we leave this place, if God has spoken to your heart and you need to pray with any of your brothers or sisters or share something with them, you're the body of Christ. We're here to build one another up. You share that word of encouragement, or if you say, I need prayer, today's your moment. If God has turned up the heat on your heart, then you just respond to whatever God you know, has done by the Holy Spirit. You know, Why go home the same why come down here and take this time if we don't want to be changed? Let us be changed by the Word of God, by the Holy Spirit, by the love of Christ. So, this beautiful service. Steve, I, I would like you to play one more time. If you could just play, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Great way to close our service. Like I said, if you need to make any decisions, you just do that between you and the Lord. Today is your day. Today is your moment. Don't say, 
I'm going to wait for a more convenient time. Do you know that you even have a more convenient time? Do you know you have tomorrow? Is it guaranteed? No, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. You know, if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. We don't even know. We're not guaranteed tomorrow, but you have today. Steve? Come, let us worship and bow down. You guys are all stand. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, and the sheep of His hand, was the sheep of His hand. Come, let us worship them. Let him carry your gospel. Let him carry your joy. In Jesus' name.